Hi everyone, uh, my name is Dr. Chris Murphy. I'm a laser plasma physicist and researcher at the University of York. Um, I'm also the admissions tutor, so I, I'm responsible for kind of um, bringing new physicists into the world of physics at the University of York. Um, welcome to this. This is our third nuclear masterclass. It's great to see so many people here again. Uh, it's always really nice to have a have a full crowd, especially when it's such an interesting topic to discuss. A few things before we get started, sort of housekeeping things. If you'd like subtitles, you can turn these on by using the CC or show captions button on your screen. It'll either be at the bottom or the top, depending on, on what kind of display you're using. If you have any Wi-Fi issues at all, don't worry about it. If you get kicked out of the webinar for any reason, you can just... Uh, jump back in by using the same link as you already used to get in the first place. Uh, just to point out, this webinar is being recorded and will be shared with all ticket holders on the Nuclear Masterclass webpage early next week. So if you do miss anything or you get kicked out, you can't get back in, you can always watch again um, early next week once that link is shared with you. If you've got any questions for anything about the Nuclear Masterclass or particularly for any of the speakers that you want, want to put to them, then you can put those questions to any of the speakers by pressing the Q&A button, which should be at the bottom of your screen. And at the end of each of the talks, I'll put as many of those questions to them as possible um, at the end of the talks and maybe even have a joint session with both speakers at the end where we can have another sort of discussion about the interesting topics being covered. So to tonight's event, tonight we'll be finding all about the plans for a new prototype fusion energy plant called STEP, which stands for the Spherical Tokamak for Energy Production. We'll hear first from a fusion technologist, Chris Ash. I'll then put some questions to Chris before handing over to development engineer and the technology lead, Sun Chi Chen. Um, there will then be an opportunity to ask a few questions of Shun, Sun Chi, and then we'll finish the webinar with a Q&A from both, both of our speakers. So to introduce Chris, as I said, this is Chris. Uh, he is a fusion technologist. He currently works in the Power Plant Modeling and Integration Group, which means he works at the cutting edge of fusion design. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Chris. Lovely. OK. Okay, welcome to this talk. Obviously, my name is Chris, so we're just going to give a brief introduction to sort of the magnetic confinement research we do here at UKA, and then a further few details about the STEP program. So who are we as the UKA? So the UKA, or the UK Atomic Energy Authority, is the UK's National Fusion Research Laboratory. So our mission is to lead the delivery of sustainable fusion energy and maximize the scientific and economic benefits. And the way we do that is well, one of the main ways is we're doing what's known as the STEP program. So spherical talk of energy production. And the mission for that is to deliver a UK prototype fusion energy plant targeting 2040 and showing a pathway to commercial viability of fusion. So what actually is fusion then? So we're all sort of used to obviously fission, which we see obviously already around us in fission power plants. So for this graph here, we can see sort of the main ways in which fusion and fission produce power. So we're used to it them see fission, this top right bit here, where we're pretty much breaking up large nuclei and making them into slightly smaller nuclei. So we get pretty much a release of energy when we get increase in binding energy of those products. So as we can see here from fission, we've got quite a small yield, um, small change in this part here. But also when we look at fusion, especially here at the start, we get a massive increase in yield. And obviously the place we're trying to exploit is this region here. So this is the, the fusing together of extremely light hydrogen nuclei. And that gives us the, the biggest benefit in terms of uh, energy gain. So fusion normally has about four times as much energy gain per mass than fission does. So what type of fuels are we actually using in fusion? So as I said, we all use different isotopes of hydrogen. The main ones that we are really concerned about are isotopes of hydrogen called deuterium and tritium. So first of all, deuterium is just normal hydrogen, except it has an extra uh, neutron. Um, it's pretty well abundant on Earth. So one in every 6,000 or so molecules of seawater has a deuterium atom in it, and it's naturally stable. So we've got plentiful supplies here on Earth. The other one we use is tritium, which again is just a hydrogen um, atom, but this time it has two extra neutrons. Um, it has a radioactive half-life of 12 and a half years. Um, and the good benefit about it as well is that we can actually produce it inside the fusion machines. So the fusion machine itself can actually produce its own fuel. Um, and at the moment, the only current world supply is only about 20 or 30 kilos. So I said, obviously, we use the deuterium and tritium fuels. So obviously, why do we use these specific fuels? So if we look at this graph on the right here, this is sort of our reaction probability versus energy. So obviously, we have our center of mass energy here, which is pretty much the total energy if two particles were colliding head on to each other. So if we say here, um, if we look at deuterium, obviously, it's much lower than deuterium tritium. In this case, so obviously 
the benefit we want to sort of exploit is the DT reaction, because obviously it's got the highest sort of cross-section or basically reaction probability possible. So obviously it's got about 100 times more reactivity than deuterium and deuterium alone. So obviously you want that because obviously that will increase the fusion power density of your machine. So if we look here at the equations, pretty much of those reactions. So when two deuteriums fuse, so two, two hydrogens, you can get either a helium-3, a neutron, and then 3.27 mega electron volts of energy. But another good benefit as well is if we merge two deuteriums as well, we also have a chance of producing a hydrogen-3, which obviously, again, is our tritium fuel. So deuterium fusion by itself can obviously produce our tritium fuel that we want to use inside the machine as well. And that comes for 4.03 MeV of energy as well. But obviously, the main reaction really, we really want to use is obviously the fusing of deuterium and tritium. Um, from this, we can produce helium-4, a neutron, and then about eight to, or 17 and a half MeVs worth of energy. And the sort of breakdown of that energy is that about 80% of that, so about 14 MeV, goes to the neutron, and then 20% goes to the helium itself. So obviously, we know fusion happens uh, throughout our solar system and the universe. So we know stars obviously do produce fusion. So what's so special about stars themselves? So obviously we know stars are natural fusion machines because that's pretty much how it gives us all the light and heat here on Earth. And the way they do that is pretty much through immense temperatures. So obviously the sun's surface is about 5,000 degrees Celsius, but its core is about 15 million. So obviously they've got really strong confinement. So obviously they've got immense gravitational forces holding them together constantly. And then they're very high density in the core. So the sun's core is about 20 times more dense than iron. So the extreme sort of temperatures and pressures. But obviously, if we were going to recreate this sort of energy on Earth, we obviously haven't got that mass gravitational sort of strength to keep that reaction together. So how do we do that? So we would use what's known as a tokamak fusion machine. So because we can't get these really high densities and pressures, we have to go to even higher temperatures. So about 150 million degrees Celsius, so about 10 times hotter than the core of the sun. And then obviously to get that confinement and to sort of keep that reaction going, what we do is instead we use magnetic fields to hold and control the plasma with a really hot sort of fuel together as we are actually causing the reaction. So here's a breakdown of the tokamak machine itself or a generic tokamak. So as you can see, it's sort of based in a sort of toroidal donut shape. So if you look here, this pink bit in the middle would be our sort of standard for the plasma. And if you look around here, so the main sort of things that keep it together is these blue coils here, so the toroidal field coils, all they do is pretty much keep the plasma going around the machine, so around the donut. And in order to keep the plasma stable itself and keep it off the walls, we also need to drive a current in the plasma here um, going around the ring. And as we know, because light currents attract, obviously if we drive a big current in the plasma, that will pinch the, cur pinch the plasma off the walls um, and pretty much you know, keep it off the machine itself. Because obviously everything in here is in vacuum. And then obviously we want different plasma shapes because that can give us different reaction performance. We have these coils here, which are poloidal field coils, and they're mainly just for shaping and positioning of the plasma. And then obviously to get these, you know, these plasmas up to these temperatures, initially at the very start, we can use a very strong sort of magnetic flux swing, which we can use via what's known as a central solenoid, which is this green piece in here. So at the very start of the plasma is sort of burst, obviously we're injecting fuel at room temperature. But also we need to ionize that very quickly and get up to temperatures very quickly. And the way we can do that is by using the central solenoid, by changing a lot of current in the coil, that causes a lot of inductance inside the plasma and that heats it up very quickly. So some of the machines we have at uh, UK AA is probably the most famous is JET or the Joint European Taurus, um, which sadly shut down last December after nearly 40 years of operations. So obviously JET was operated on you know, behalf of Eurofusion here at UK AA at Cullum. Uh, from 1983 to 2023. Um, when it was operating, it was the world's largest and most advanced tokamak in the world. Um, and it was the only tokamak that was capable of actually using the specific deuterium and tritium fuels um, over the past 25 years. There was obviously previous machines, one in Princeton called TFTR, which used tritium before, but it shut down in 1997. So Jets literally being probably the most powerful and most sophisticated tokamak of its time. And just last year, we set a record for fusion energy production, where we produced 69 megajoules of fusion uh, energy over a five-second pulse. So a five-second sustained flat-top plasma. So here's a picture of JET itself. So this is what JET would have looked like just before we shut it down. Um, obviously, it's evolved quite severely over the years. Um, we also have here on the left is our mascot system, which is our remote maintenance system. Um, this is pretty much the main way we maintain the inside of the machine. So sort of breakdown of the inside of the machine and then the different bits. Obviously, this is not a exhaustive list, but this covers the main thing. So obviously, looking here on the right, here we have banks of radio frequency heating antennas. 
So again, obviously we have to ramp up plasma to these sort of you know, incredible temperatures. And obviously I said before, the main way we can do that is with the central solenoid, but obviously that can only heat it up so much because one of the weird things about plasmas is, is that the hotter they get, the less resistance they get. So if you were trying to heat something based on its resistance and it keeps losing resistance to get hotter, you're not gonna be able to get that efficiency. So also we need external sort of heating and current drive systems. So obviously one of the main ways here is with this radio frequency heating antenna, obviously because all a plasma is, is just loose charged particles. All this does is pretty much inject sort of radio frequency waves. And obviously all the particles do is follow that wave and they accelerate as they do. And obviously as they accelerate, they heat up. So again, as we said, we have to keep the plasma off the walls. So obviously the machine here is coated in a mixture of tungsten, beryllium protective tiles going all around the sides of the machine, especially here in the bottom, which we call the diverter region, because obviously as we're doing these reactions, we're producing, obviously, as I said, the if we're doing DT fusion, we're producing that helium-4. Obviously, it's going to, it has charge, so it's going to stay contained in the plasma. And obviously, if we keep doing the reaction, you know, the helium-4 is going to build up and build up, and then obviously it's going to start you know, choking out the reaction. So the diverter here is a bit like the exhaust in the entire system, or a bit like an exhaust in a car. Um, so pretty much what we can do is we can shape the plasma down into that region and that can exhaust pretty much all of the sort of waste particles from the plasma out and they can then be recycled. So looking at this video then, this is a video of the experiment or the record shot we did from last year. So this is the live color video, what it looks like in the side of the machine. So again, here's our diverter region in the bottom. So as you can see there, obviously it's a bit weird because obviously in terms of that, I said the plasma is 150 million degrees. Um, but in that video itself, the bit you can see right through. So as here, we'll wait for it to get up to flat top. So if we look at this video here. So I said here about the diverter, which is our waste exhaust system. Um, so technically the entire sphere or volume here is completely filled with plasma going around the ring. Um, the diverter there region there is obviously glowing. It's surprisingly weird because it's glowing because it's technically the coldest bit. So that's uh, only at about 4,000 Kelvin. But the entire rest of this volume because it's so hot at about 150 million degrees, it only radiates um, radiation away in the gamma and X-ray, which we can see, also because it's a visible camera. So technically the hottest bit is completely invisible. And then only down this diverter region where it's a couple of thousand degrees Kelvin, does it re-emit back in that visible, which we can actually see. So again, another exciting video from our experiments last year. This is what's known as a shattered pellet injector system. So obviously a way to obviously protect uh, fusion plants is we don't want all of that fusion you know energy from the plasma if there's a disruption in the machine pretty much throwing it all onto the walls so we have a system there with a shallow pellet injector this can pretty much fire basically a pellet of fuel or a noble gas like uh, xenon into the plasma and pretty much the pellet goes in shatters and then this allows the plasma to quickly radiate that energy away and you know before disruption so the sort of time scale of this video, you're looking at about probably, you know, a hundredth of a second of which in real time this is actually happening. So the whole goal of the system is that it's able to detect disruptions before they happen. They can then fire the pellet in and they'll then cause the plasma to radiate most of its energy away before it can actually throw itself onto the walls of the vessel itself. So another uh, one of the machines we have on site is called MassU or Mega Ampere Spherical Tokamak Upgrade. Um, it's much smaller than jet, so it's only about one meter across. Um, so one meter in terms of from the center of the machine to the center of the vessel where the plasma would be. But it's a bit different um, here in this figure here. So jet is what's known as a conventional tokamak. So it's more donut shaped, um, but mast is more shaped like a cord apple. And um, there are many benefits to this, mainly in terms of plasma performance. Um, and obviously at UK, we are very much interested in spherical tokamaks, hence the spherical tokamak for energy production program. Um, so one of the main things that MAST has as well, is it's known as the Super X diverter. It's obviously much different from what we have on JET. And when it's looking pretty much at primary plasma exhaust problems. Um, so it's looking at pretty much reducing sort of heat flux and materials, which increases the lifetime of the machine. So the Super X diverter compared to a normal sort of conventional diverter in a conventional tokamak, normally removes about 10 times less heat flux. So it you know, lowers the heat flux on tiles about 10 times more than a conventional diverter, which is obviously what you want in a commercial machine, because therefore your parts last longer and therefore you know, your machine is down for the maintenance less. So what are some of the current challenges that we're facing? So obviously if we look at sort of the fusion records, so we define a value called QP, uh, which is pretty much the ratio between our output power we get from, from the plasma or fusion power compared to the energy we inject to pretty much heat the plasma. Um, so obviously QP1, so Q plasma is break even. So I'm getting more fusion power out from the plasma than I injected straight into it. 
So Jets Q record is only 0.67, which obviously is below this break even. Um, but obviously in the news recently, um, at NIF or the National Ignition Facility, which takes a different approach, they got a Q of 1.9, um, pretty much very, very quickly um, in a very short amount of time. Um, but obviously looking at this bottom right figure here in terms of the different sort of fusion powers and sustainments we've had over the years. So the first sort of, you know, first time we used deuterium and tritium together in JET uh, was in 1997. And that's where we set our Q record. But as we can see here, it was very transient or it was very, you know, it was, it started very fast and ended very quickly. Um, but then over the years, obviously, what we've been able to do is pretty much extend out this and pretty much because obviously the same amount of power output, but then again, sustained for much longer, so much more total energy out. So as I said, obviously, we're talking about SuperX and sort of, you know, keeping the materials um, sort of protected so they can last longer. So obviously, that's the sort of things we're looking at at the moment. So obviously, having those sort of novel materials that can stand up the fusion conditions longest. And again, also obviously, if we're going to have this running as a fusion power plant, obviously, we want, you know, the plants to be running for hours rather than seconds. So obviously, sustaining those burning plasmas that are producing that energy. Um, is what we want to do. And obviously we're obviously looking for reducing maintenance because obviously downtime for maintenance is sort of one of the main cost drivers for fusion. So obviously you want the power plant to be up and running as much as possible and you want to reduce your maintenance time. And then obviously looking at commercialization. So obviously everyone's looking at pretty much building, running and fueling active power plants, which no one's actually really done before. So obviously that's what everyone wants to try and get the know-how and how to do. So fusion at the moment then, so obviously fusion is moving from sort of laboratory physics space now into the massive sort of industrial sort of delivery era. So this picture here is what's known as the ITER site. So ITER is a tokamak device that is being built currently in the south of France. So this picture here was taken last September. As you can see, it's an absolutely colossal site. So this part here, here is the tech building where the actual machine is kept. And then all of these bits over here is all pretty much the auxiliary equipment that supports the entire system. So you've got all your switches here from, from the grid itself. You've got your heat exchangers over here, and then you've got your control buildings all the way down here. So it's an absolutely colossal site. So ITER itself. So ITER itself is probably the world's biggest scientific collaboration. So it's a collaboration between the EU, China, India, Japan, South Korea, Russia, and the United States. So the ITER project started about, you know, in the mid 90s, sort of at the end of the Cold War. And it was pretty much a sort of international collaboration to bring sort of commercial scale or fusion power to the entire world. So if we compare it to JET, so it obviously is replacing JET as the most advanced tokamak. And it has about, you know, in terms of volume of the plasma that's inside the machine, it's about eight times higher, but it will produce five, you know, 50 times more power than JET itself. So JET could produce about 10 megawatt or 10 megawatts of fusion power. Well, Eater's hoping to do, you know, 500 megawatts of fusion power. So obviously it's only hoping to inject 50 megawatts. So obviously that will give us a few plasma value of around 10. Um, but obviously ITER itself, um, obviously as being an international collaboration project, you know, through many sort of country states, obviously it's a very big machine. So obviously I said, JET was about a three meter machine. ITER you're looking at about 6.2 meters. So from the center of this column here to the center of the plasma is about 6.2. And if you've noticed as well, just sort of reference for scale, we've got a person down here for scale of the size of the machine. So obviously the entire sort of top of my call we showed in the last picture is over 73 meters tall. So it's an absolutely colossal project. But obviously the main piece of today is obviously STEP. So obviously STEP is the UK's own sort of prototype fusion power plant that will demonstrate net energy from fusion. So obviously ITER itself isn't going to actually put net electricity on the grid. It's still there to demonstrate the physics of burning plasmas and producing actual fusion power. So just uh, recently, obviously, we've got the site location, which is in West Burn in North Nottinghamshire. So it's going to be based on the same spherical tokamak concept as what MAST has. So it's going to be that cord apple shape instead of the sort of conventional shape that JET and ITER have. Um, so not donut shape, but more cord apple. And obviously, it's going to have a commercially driven basis. So we're hoping to obviously demonstrate predictable net energy production. It's going to show fuel self-sufficiency. So as I said before about producing tritium in the machine itself. Obviously, a full sort of loop accountability of producing, you know, your own fuel in the machine itself, and then also show incredible maintenance solutions. Because obviously, no one's built, um, you know, a working fusion power plant, so there's a lot of know-how to gain there, and pretty much on how to run and operate these machines. And then, obviously, the sort of expected Q value we get here is around ten. So obviously, similar to either, but obviously, it's going to have much different fusion powers and injective powers, and obviously, that difference obviously will come out as net electric in the end. So thank you very much for listening. Any questions? Thanks so much for that. That was really interesting, Chris. Um, there are a, a bunch of questions. Uh, some of them, I think, are probably more um, 
sort of well, one of them is my nuclear physics question, which is uh, is to do with the cross section graph that you showed in slide five, where there's a there's a this little spike yes. in the p beryllium. Is that is that some is that resonance probably, or, or do we know what that is? It's most likely a resonance, yes. So obviously, um, from an egg confinement, we're mainly looking at obviously deuterium and tritium. But as you probably saw from that graph, obviously that sort of resonance peak is at very high temperatures. Um, so obviously that leads itself towards you know very small compact machines. They're looking at much much higher um, sort of uh, temperatures because obviously you know the hotter you get you know your sort of plasma, the, the faster it starts tries to radiate away that energy. So obviously that gives that leads to basically a different configuration of the machine. So much smaller, much more compact. But obviously that obviously has different and its own set of unique engineering and physics challenges. So excellent. There's a few here that are def. I mean I think. I th I think since she's going to talk about superconductors a little bit, so I'm going to yep. hold off on that one for now. Um, uh, and also, I think about careers, but I think I'll ask both of you that at the end. Um, why why did Jet shut down? I mean, I guess that's it's a political, financial yep. rather than scientific reason. Yeah. Or? So so Jet's had its lifetime extended several times now. You know, Jet was only meant to sort of last probably around to the end of the nineties, and you know, even with uh, you know early two thousands, it was going to be shut down, and then obviously run about late you know 20 teens it was going to be shut down but obviously the, the sort of benefits from the sort of scientific know-how you know being the only machine that could operate with deuterium and tritium it was a benefit there to the fusion community obviously now you know jet was you know designed you know started being designed in 1973 so the whole core infrastructure of the jet facility is obviously starting to show its age um obviously and there's also another tokamak in japan called jt60 sa and um, which is pretty much a half scale model leader um, which is sort of now taking the baton um, off from JET as sort of a physics basis, because obviously all the information from JET was pretty much funneled into sort of how we were going to operate ITER. Um, obviously now JT60 fills that role, so obviously JT60 started up again, so obviously it's now ready to take the baton on. So. Excellent. Um, I mean, there's, the, the questions are flooding in now. Um, I think a quick answer to this, because you kind of already touched on it, why does the plasma not met, melt JET? So the plasma itself, so in terms of the actual, you know, we have really, really high temperatures. So obviously the temperature in terms of, you know, what it actually means is how, you know, how wide is the distribution of energies within the plasma or what's the sort of, you know, energy of each particle. So it's not really the whole total energy of the system. So in terms of jets, so obviously we've got about, you know, plasma volume, about, a, about 80 meters cubed. But the actual amount of material in there, the actual weight of the plasma, you're looking at milligrams. You know, if you compare it to, you know, so you're injecting, you know, tons and tons of heat into it, but the actual amount of matter that's there is really, really low. So obviously if it hits something, you know, because it's so low mass, but it's really high energy, it just dissipates that heat really quickly. Um, so obviously we've looked at obviously scenarios where jet disrupts and puts energy onto the tiles. Um, obviously it can heat the surrounding material up to a couple hundred degrees. Remember, you've got something at really high temperature, really low mass. So the total energy of that is then hitting something that's, you know, so, you know, hundreds of kilos you know, so there's a lot more sort of you know heat capacity there in the surrounding structure. So obviously, yeah. So basically, you keep it away from the edges with the magnetic fields, and if you don't, if it actually does get towards the edges, you end up dissipating heat pretty quickly because there's yeah. so little mass. Okay. Yeah. That's cool. Um, I've got somebody who clearly has done a lot of reading, and um, and so I'll ask one. I think you did mention uh, viable methods for reducing del deleterious effects of edge localized modes on plasma stability, which. I, you talked about pellet injection, didn't you? Which kind of yes, that helps mitigate elms, does it? So localized modes. It's not my area of expertise, um, but obviously the main reason we can't inject obviously pellets. One of the main reasons also is we're looking at disruption mitigation. Um, obviously, if we want to operate in an elm scenario, so obviously edge localized modes are sort of so that detrimental effect to plasmas obviously can lead to disruptions. Um, obviously, if pellet fueling obviously is the way forward then obviously we look at obviously a whole range of different ways to pretty much you know produce the edge localized modes because obviously if we've gone into edge mode or high confinement mode obviously which gives us that increase in confinement time but obviously with it comes the edge localized modes so obviously we're looking at especially for step we're looking at a whole range of sort of hybrid plasma scenarios which we can operate at so highly rated of you know with very low elms is what we're looking at mainly so Excellent. I mean, I think I'll move on to, and we'll move on to saying just uh, very quick ones. How much does this roughly cost? What's the current budget for, for either step and or eater? So step itself, we do not have a cost budget yet because we are still in the concept design phase. So we do not have pretty much a set sort of costing budget at the moment. Um, the eater project, um, also the costing for eater has changed over the years. Um, obviously, because it's collaboration between several countries. Um, obviously, the costing is sort of shared between because obviously each country is building their own separate parts and then they're all shipped to the ITER site. 
Um, so I think the sort of cost for each year around, I think, was, it depends, obviously, what year you take the costing. I think it was about, can't. yeah, so it all depends what accounts you talk for, but it would be normally in the couple of billion range. Um, obviously, as a big international project, you've got a lot, a lot of stuff to move around. Yeah. So. Cool. Well, I mean, there's a bunch more, but I think we'll sort of funnel them into the big Q&A at the end. So that, th th thanks again for that. Um, we'll uh, move on to the next one and hopefully invite you back at the end for a few more questions for you and Sanji. No worries. Cheers. Thanks. So now on to our second speaker who has joined us in the webinar room now. This is uh, Sanji Chen. Uh, uh, she is a development engineer and recently took the post of technology lead. So very important person, I guess, for the project. Um, this means that she's responsible for the development of novel technologies for fusion energy. So if you want to know lots about the technology developments, uh, I guess we've got the right person on the webinar tonight. Amazing. Thank you. So um, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for the introduction, Chris. Um, and Christopher, my colleague, has um, done an excellent job so far in explaining what fusion is and what the physics are. Um, so now, like you said, we're in the delivery era. We have to think about how do we make these things. STEP is one solution um, that the UK government thinks uh, thinks can add to the fusion mix, thinks can add to the energy mix one day, so that fusion is a viable part to um, actually generate uh, electricity for us. However, with STEP, because it's more of a circle shape um, rather than a donut shape that we see with tip, with other tokamaks like JET or with other projects like ITER, uh, it's more compact which is good in terms of maybe reducing the footprint in terms of land mass, uh, in terms of a uh, sort of land footprint or reducing material cost, for example, because it's smaller. This still produces um, additional challenges that, challenges that we have to address when we're essentially packing more plasma into a smaller space. So some of the major challenges that we address on step at the moment is um, developing high performing materials. There are very um, stringent is a very stringent environment, is a very extreme environment in terms of heat, in terms of vacuum, um, in terms of neutrons and gammas. So we have to develop materials that can deal with this. We mentioned tritia, uh, tritium earlier on in the presentation. Tritium is one of the fuels that we make, uh, fuels that we use. However, there is a limited supply on Earth. So we have to be able to breed more of it. We have to make more of it so that we can produce enough energy for this to be commercially viable. Along with producing tritium, we have to learn how to process it so that it can be used in the machine. This process is referred to collectively as the fuel cycle. Someone earlier mentioned superconducting magnets. So I will be going through that briefly. To be able to confine the plasma in a more spherical shape, um, and just in general for larger for larger tokamaks, we'll need very high magnetic fields, and this can that, this can be produced with superconducting magnets, uh, co as compared to conventional magnets that are used on jet and other uh, tokamaks that exist already. Um, and of course. People can't handle, for, for the most part, things that go into the machine or things that the machine are made out of. So we use robots. Uh, for this, we need to develop, uh, we have a robotics program and we need to develop robotic maintenance strategies to be able to build the machine, maintain the machine, and at the end of its life, disassemble the machine. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, so to briefly go through some of the material challenges, I uh, hope... It's looking like a blank screen for me. There we go. Um, so like I said, it's a very high heat environment. The plasma itself is extremely hot, but the surrounding um, areas manage pretty high heat loads as well. For superconducting magnets to work, they have to be at cryogenic temperatures. But for the, uh, for the materials that are around the plasma, they can go up to 2000 degrees. So that's a very, very large temperature range. And we have to find materials that can deal with all of these, as well as the thermal gradients and the stresses from that um, that come from such large thermal gradients. Um, because some of these are operating at such a high heat or in such a high heat environment, we have to make sure that they are compatible with coolants. Some of the materials have to be actively cooled during operation so that they still stay, stay in their safe operation windows. So as well as uh, making sure that they can be actively cooled, we have to make sure that they are chemically compatible with the coolants. Neutrons and gammas come out of the plasma. They come flying out of the plasma, hitting the walls of our machine. Um, neutrons can degrade some of these materials. So we have to use materials that can withstand that so that the, the machine has a, has a suitable lifetime. Gamma, gammas, for the most part, just uh, produce a lot of heating in our materials. So that's something that we have to manage too through active cooling. And some of the materials, such as, for example, the superconductors and some of the electronics, are very, very sensitive um, to the neutrons and to the gammas. So for some parts of the machine, we have to put in additional neutron shielding or additional gamma shielding so that they can still perform their jobs. 
some for the um during operation these things you know when we're producing energy that goes onto the grid is that steady state you know we're producing a steady amount of energy but there's also transient modes that we have to deal with where um the power production may uh, decrease very rapidly and we have to be able to deal with that very rapid change in the load cases so we have to make sure we have materials that can handle that in terms of the structural and the electromagnetic loads and some of the materials that we use for shielding might be brittle so we have to make sure that those are designed in such a way that they will survive such cases because there are so many different types of materials um, and different places, some in close proximity to each other, some of them have to be directly joined, even though they have quite different material properties. So joining and uh, learning how to manufacture these parts in such a way that they survive the environment is also a very large part of the materials development, as well as actually developing a supply chain for some of the materials that are potentially very rare um, and might not exist in great quantities already. So as far as some of the work goes into uh, that goes into this, um, some of this is my work and some of this is work that is done on jet. Um, this video that hopefully you can see in enough resolution um, that looks a bit like an elastic band being pulled is actually a piece of nuclear grade steel. This is how we test them as far as tensile testing goes. We pull them with very high pressure to see when they break and then we characterize that to see how strong and how well they perform. The sort of glowing square under a spiral, under a coil there, is another piece of steel that's being tested under high heat, so we can see whether it survives. Um, the other image that's here with some small red arrows, hopefully you can see my cursor where I can point towards it. If not, um, don't worry about too much, but there's uh, small bubbles there. Those form during a radiation, um, and those bubbles can actually create cracks later on. So we want to be able to characterize that so that we can account for that in the design. Not only do we do physical work, we do an extensive amount of modeling. Um, so sometimes we want to be able to just predict how these materials will act. Um, this one that you're seeing with some of the crazy lines and some of the spirals is us modeling how, um, how tungsten may perform or how tungsten may react when neutrons hit it or when um, other sort of high energy particles hit it. And then some of the tungsten atoms go flying off. So this is a process called erosion. And we want to be able to characterize whether tungsten can survive that. So as well as materials challenges, like I mentioned, we have tritium breeding and the fuel cycle. So I think we went briefly through um, the chemical reaction or the nuclear reactions that happen so we can produce energy. Uh, again, hopefully you can see my cursor. Uh, so out of this uh, fusion, out of this fusion reaction, we get a very high energy neutron. This carries away about 80% of the energy from the reaction. So this comes out of the plasma. And for us to be able to breed more tritium, we want it to hit something we call a breeding blanket that surrounds um, that surrounds the plasma in the machine. If this blanket contains lithium, it can produce a further reaction that produces another helium and then tritium, which can be cycled back into the original uh, fusion reaction. So this is the process that we, uh, that we refer to as tritium breeding. Like we said earlier, the tritium that already exists on Earth is not very much 20 to 30 kilograms that we currently use for research at the moment. But to be able to produce a reliable amount of energy, um, that's enough for, for a, a city to use. We need a lot more than this. So again, this can be bred in the machine. Because that neutron is so important to us to be able to make more tritium, sometimes we also use neutron multipliers. So that interacts with the original neutron to produce more neutrons that can hit more lithium atoms and produce more tritium, which is great for everyone. Um, two examples of this are lead or beryllium. Some of the engineering challenges that go into this um, are looking at ways to enrich the lithium. Um, if you've noticed, this is lithium-6 that produces uh, the sort of uh, nuclear reaction that we want. However, um, for the uh, lithium-7 is more abundant, so we have to enrich the lithium to have more lithium-6 available to actually produce the tritium that we want. Because of, uh, well, this is a very difficult thing to do, many components um, performing different roles will have to exist in a relatively small amount of space, which, uh, which means that the nuclear architecture of, of the actual uh, piece itself is very important to be able to perform its job overall, which is really many tiny little jobs all squeezed into one. Qualifying something that has not been made yet, of course, again, is a challenge. And being able to test something um, under so, so many conditions, under high radiation environments, under high heat, under vacuum, currently there's not many ways to develop this. Uh, there's current, not many ways to test this, but there are ways to test this in development as we speak. The structural materials to make this out of is also um, something that requires a lot of development further. We want to make sure we're making more tritium than we are using tritium, and the ratio between that is referred to as the tritium breeding ratio. So making sure that's well above one is also important to us. Tritium permeation, 
and tritium transport and storage um, is also something that is some, that has to be managed. Tritium is just a form of hydrogen, which is one of the smallest elements that exists in the world, or the smallest element, but tritium is a slightly heavier version. Um, because it's so small, it's quite tricky to hold in one place, it's quite tricky to store and it's quite tricky to transport. So that's another area of research here. Some of the workings that's happening in this area um, involves, again, making this blanket. If I bring back my cursor, hopefully you can see it. If you imagine this as the cross section of the, um, of the tokamak, in the middle here is where the plasma exists, and then uh, surrounding the vacuum vessel um, is this blanket. So this is um, surrounded in sort of lithium containing blanket modules that will produce the tritium that will be extracted out, processed, and fed back into the machine. This is kind of a disassembled version of one that will exist on demo, which is um, another type of tokamak um, that will hopefully be producing a net amount of energy that's being um, managed by Eurofusion. Up here is a patent that was recently approved from our team on step um, for one type of, of, of tritium breeding sort of modules. There's many types that exist, many designs that exist. Earlier I mentioned that we have limited testing capability, um, but one that we are hoping to use is one that's actually made up near by the University of York in Rotherham. We have another facility, uh, we have another campus there in Rotherham where Chimera exists. Chimera is a way that we can test things under high heat loads, under high magnetic loads and under vacuum all at the same time. So this will be very important for testing future blanket modules. Superconducting magnets, so back to I think what someone asked me earlier. So because we need the high magnetic fields um, and superconductor, uh, superconducting magnets can produce this with little resistance, it's very important for us to include this um, technology in the tokamak. However, superconductors need to operate at cryogenic temperatures, which is something that might not bode well with fusion temperatures, which is, you know, to the order of 100 or something million degrees. So the difference in that has to be managed. The materials that we use for these superconductors are quite low maturity, so we have to learn how to design things with things that have not been as developed. Um, superconductor materials are very sensitive to neutron damage, so we have to shield that, we have to manage that, and then we also have to manage the magnetic loads that are on the rest of the structure in the tokamak. The actual superconducting material itself is actually made in small ribbons, which I'll show you later, but we have to figure out how to make these small ribbons into things that are giant, things that are to the order of tens of meters big and tall to be able to, to contain all the plasma. We have to, again, develop a supply chain to be able to get as much as we need. Um, and then we have to overcome the size limits. Operationally, we have to be able to manage the quenching. So if anyone knows anything about superconductors, you know that they can quench. Um, we don't want that to happen because that means we'll lose our power. We have to be, find a way to, uh, to manage that and to detect it before it happens. Because this hap uh, needs cryogenic temperatures, we also have to manage um, the amount of energy it takes to cool these down and make sure that it's not too much, that we're extracting too much energy from, um, from the tokamak itself because we still want to produce a net amount of power. At the UKAA and at STEP, we also have really extensive modeling capability and we want to be able to um, apply this more so to the superconductor so that we can predict its performance. So that's something that's in development as well. Some of the work that we're doing here so like I said, these uh, superconducting materials that we're interested in exist in small ribbons. Um, one, of the, one of the options is something called Rebco. Some of the work that we've done here is, a is actually testing the superconducting material under irradiation and then seeing um, how well it still performs when it's been sort of, you know, hit by a bunch of gamma photons. Uh, like I said, we need a lot of this, 3, 000, something like 30,000 kilometers of this high temperature conducting tape is what we'll need to be able to make a sufficiently sized uh, magnet system. Another way that we might be able to test these, um, test these concepts is something um, that's happening in collaboration between the UK AEA and STEP and Kyoto Fusioneering in Japan, who have um, intentions to build a huge testing facility that will include irradiation testing, will include high heat, high vacuum, active cooling with various types of, of coolants. Um, so being able to test these technologies under the relevant conditions is something that's, again, super important to us and that we're excited to be doing. And lastly, robotics and fusion. Uh, some of the challenges that we that we see here um, because of uh, because of the geometry of this is that we have a lot of cramped spaces. We have a lot of awkwardly sized sort of components that have to be managed by robots and have to be managed in real time. So not only do we have cramped spaces, but we have spaces that might have latent heat. We have uh, spaces that might have sort of uh, radioactive decay. And we also have to figure out how to manage any waste 
Um, although it's low level, we have to figure out how, how to manage that at the end of the tokamak's life. Maintenance is very important to keep this running, of course. Um, so when it comes to sort of the joints, any connectors, any bolts, they have to be continually maintained as the, as the reactor is operating, as well as um, non-destructively evaluating uh, some of the parts before they might fail. We want to be able to repair these in situ. So as this is running, and we want this to be very reliable. We, have this, we need this to be very available so that this is commercially viable. Assurance, again, is something important. We're creating things that have not been made before. We have to create things that last a lifetime of the, of the tokamak. We have to be able to regulate this and we have to be able to create a large enough talent pool and um, pretty comprehensive training so that we always have operators for such robots. Here we have a picture of just one robot, um, but probably one of the most important robots that comes out of the UKAA. This is Mascot. And this is a remote maintenance robot that was developed specifically for JET. And it's operated in lifetime by an operator with similar, I guess, robot arms that are controlled. Um, this happens in lifetime. So this robot mascot will go into JET, do the repair that it needs, um, and then come back out. And then JET is ready to go again. And again, this is managed all lifetime by a very specially trained operator. Uh, this is Spot. So Spot is a Boston Dynamics robot that maybe some people have seen online before. We have a few of these at the UKAA because they're very valuable as learning tools for us to be able to learn more about how robots like this will operate. And Spot recently himself, uh, what I call this one, he, we have a few, um, has been involved in some decommissioning work um, in, in other parts of the world. So we've learned a lot more about how these robotics and, and how the electronics can handle um, such radiation, uh, such environments with like sort of you know, waste and things like that. Um, some other robotics works that we've done are figuring out how to maintain the machine. Um, so this includes something like what we call a laser pig or a laser piglet that can go into corroded pipes, uh, sort of take away the corrosion so that they can perform uh, well again. So this is uh, a summary of some of the main um, engineering challenges. And I think collectively, uh, this really gives us a lot of confidence um, in that in, in our mission, in our goals, um, the main one of which is making sure if fusion energy is environmentally responsible, um, making sure that it's commercially viable and making sure that, um, you know, it's going to be a really key part of the energy mix, hopefully coming online in the latter half of the century. Um, I think I'm ready for questions. You can find out more from our information page here. Um, go ahead and scan that QR code or take a picture and it should take you to somewhere you can get more information. Thank you. That was great. That was really interesting. Thanks so much for that talk. I really, I mean, it does just show that to, to be able to do this fusion stuff, it's not it's not a nuclear physics problem, it's not a plasma physics problem, it's not a material science problem, it's not a robotics, it's not engineering, it's all of these things together, right? Exactly. Yeah, it's um, every job you can imagine. I think a very common question that we get is, what do I need to study to do this? And the real answer is you can study anything and find a way to get to fusion because it's such a large problem. That was exactly one of the questions that someone has already <laughs> asked us is how to, yeah, I mean, I think, I guess, physics, engineering, these kind of topics would uh, would, would be interesting. So a few questions about the breeding blanket. What exactly is the breeding blanket? What does it look like? What does it, what's it made of? Is it? So it's, it's made of a, of a bunch of things. The, the most important part for us is to include the lithium uh, somewhere in the mix. Uh, so there'll be areas which are purely for interacting with the neutrons that come out of the plasma, creating the uh, you know, reacting with the lithium, creating the tritium, and then we have to find a way to extract that from whichever form of lithium we have. Um, I'm being vague because there are so many ways to do this. Um, there are so many forms of lithium that we can use. Everyone has their, their benefits um, and their costs. So uh, the, the, blanket seeing... itself, the blanket itself exists in modules that we kind of build around the plasma. Excellent. And you're saying it should be lithium-6, not lithium-7, and there's a lithium question about six. making lithium-6 from lithium-7, but I don't think that's the point. Is lithium-7 also naturally occurring? Even though yeah, it's they're, both, they're, both naturally, they're both naturally occurring. Lithium-7 lithium is the one, um, it, it, it creates a less favourable nuclear reaction there, so, so you, uh, we prefer we prefer lithium-6. Excellent. And to get enough um, to get enough neutrons, you mentioned a breeder, is that be, or, or a multiplier, is that you hit neutron into something and then yep, more so neutrons come out? Exactly, exactly. Excellent. So that was what that was one of the questions that we had. That was interesting. Um <laughs> someone's asking, could you use superconductor magnets to be used for hover technology? I mean, I like a fusion question, but 
<laughs> I suppose they could. Um, superconductors are, well, super. Um, they're, they're really useful for a lot of things, not just fusion. And a lot of their value be comes from producing very, very high magnetic fields um, whilst taking up less space. Um, can you can you recycle the, the components if you were to take components out? Can you can the parts be recycled? I don't Some of them. Um, parts that are irradiated, probably not, um, unless they're used for research and things like that. Um, but a lot of the parts that are not irradiated, I'm sure they can be recycled. There's a whole decommissioning strategy happening for JET at the moment where some parts may be repurposed. Excellent. And the thing that was being stretched, do you say, was that tensile steel or something? I, I, that is, I that that. Uh, that particular piece of steel, I believe, was a, was actually a, a joint between a ferritic steel and um, and a stainless steel, because in that one, we're trying to practice how to join them together. So we want to see if that joint um, actually survives, which it did very well. Um, it only it only failed in the weak material and the joint itself held strong. So that's the kind of thing that you would build a tokamak, or you might build a tokamak out of, I exactly, guess. Yeah. So that's yeah. why it's relevant to the fusion industry. Mm -hmm. Someone asked about, about trying the moon for tritium. I think the problem is it's radioactive, isn't it? So it doesn't last very long. It doesn't last very long. Like we said, it only has a half-life of around 12 and a half years. So by the time it gets here, we probably, well, by the time we go and mine it and bring it back, we probably would have lost quite a lot of it. But, you know, good news for us is something that we can breed um, inside the machine. Excellent. Uh, someone's asking about the gamma radiation disrupting superconductors. Is that something that's being tested? Can it be tested? What are the yep. results of the test like? How do how do superconductors interact with the photoelectric effect? I mean, I guess these are all related. I guess it's smart yeah, smart so, person realised that yeah, basically exactly. the gamma's knock knock the electrons out, which is not good. Yeah, gamma photons. Um, yeah, definitely detrimental not just to superconductors but to a lot of the electronics. Um, so this is considered in the architecture and the design of the tokamak. We actually have specialised shielding for the neutrons and gammas to protect those to, to protect those components. Um, so rather than you know trying to make a a resistant material is, is a lot more cost effective sometimes to just put a big old shield in front of it. Excellent. And the tritium, how is it initially made? The little stock that we have, is that from reactors probably? Or? The stock that we have um, mostly comes from the Kandu reactor in Canada. So tritium can be a, a, a byproduct um, from fission reactors. Um, currently, a lot of the stockpile is made from that. Great. Um, what about using other? I mean, this is maybe more of the more of the more of the last talk. It might be useful at this point actually to get to get Chris back on. And there's a few questions I think both of you might want to answer, um, including one about well, why don't you use other light isotopes? I'm guessing that's just because helium four is ridiculously stable and therefore releases lots of energy when you make it. Is that? Yeah, that's yeah, that's precisely right. So uh, for uh, for us, hydrogen, um, it just has a great it has the greatest yield, uh, specifically deuterium tritium tritium nuclear reaction has the greatest yield um it's the easiest to manage and again like you said helium is a very very stable nucleus so it wouldn't really be practical to use that great so one for either of you and uh, maybe switch to chris to go first uh since he was speaking first what got you interested in nuclear physics engineering and how did and how do you get into how did you get into it what was your path into this role yeah so yeah i uh went to did a so I went straight from A-levels, so I did physics, maths, chemistry, and IT, or computer science. Um, I then went to university and did a sort of very broad, you know, integrated master's degree in physics, no real specialty. Um, in my fourth year, I then decided to pick the plasma science module. Um, obviously, through that, learned about, you know, jet and fusion research, um, but also didn't really know, you know, about the sort of key organizations that obviously do the fusion research. So I don't look around, um, and I literally find... Um, you know, applications for UKA, literally a few days before it closed, I went, oh, might as well stick my application in, see what happens. And obviously stuck it in and then got a call back, did the interview, and then now I'm here. So, yeah. Excellent. And what are you, B, Sanchi? Um, so I uh, did uh, nuclear science, uh, so nuclear science and materials undergraduate at the University of Birmingham. And then I went on to do um, nuclear sort of physics in general as a, as a master's, but specifically for uh, looking at reactors and things like that, looking at fission reactors. Um, so I didn't actually know much specifically about fusion um, until I started to look for graduate schemes. Um, and when I started to look for things to do for my thesis, and that's when I found out more about the UKAA. That's when I got really interested. And then uh, through the same route as Chris, that's when I, uh, I, I entered the graduate scheme. And that was actually the only graduate scheme I applied for. So I got it. <laughs> Great. I've got two related questions. Um, first one, very presumptuous. Why would you say your job is great? I mean, I assume your job is great, mm -hmm. but, but maybe it's not. I mean, maybe that's the answer. And what's your favourite aspect of your job? I mean, what makes it great? I guess it's the same question to some extent. 
Um, for me, I think it's existing on the cutting edge of technology constantly, um, just by nature of the, of the industry, because we're trying to make something that for the most part has not been achieved yet. We're always on the cutting edge of what is even humanly and technologically possible. So we're always kept on our toes. Um, so I'm never bored. I never spend a day that I never spend a day bored um, because of the of the nature of of the thing we're trying to achieve. It's a very international community. Um, we get to collaborate internationally. So I can't lie. The travel is a massive part for me. Um, that's a massive benefit for me. Being able to work all over the world um, is something that I really enjoy. Me too. And Chris, what about you? What's your best favorite part of the job? And is it, is it a good job? And do you enjoy it? And um, what's it like working at UKAEA? That's the other question that's popped up. You might want to. That's so yeah, obviously my, mine's pretty much the exact same as um, Sunchi. Obviously, it's it's pretty much you've pretty much got all of sort of physics and engineering literally culminating together into one big sort of goal or project. Um, and again, obviously for me, because I was working in jet operations, you know, I was working with people from Germany, from France, you know, people, you know, from these different labs across Europe, but fly out just to be, you know, on site operating jet. And also you get the sort of worldwide collaboration and sort of, you know, sort of uh, contacts of all these different great, you know, great scientists across the world. And also for me, at, you know, UKA, it's sort of the, the breadth as well of the work um, that we do, you know, sort of the cross disciplinary teams. So one day, obviously for me, I could be working with the magnets team and then the other day I'm working with the fuel cycle team. So obviously, you know, it allows you to hop around, you know, and obviously if you want to get to go into your wee niche, you can. So you're, you're pretty much, you know, sort of, you know, allowed to pretty much pick your own wee sort of bit of where you want to work within the organisation. Um, pretty much, yeah. Okay. Uh, another one uh, is, well, th there's a few questions related to the safety of fusion. Some of them asking about the safety risks. Some of them asking about, are you worried about the safety of step? Are you worried about the safety of these reactors? And then another one, which I think is... A, a really insightful question was, is there a problem with the public perception of the risks of, of fusion? And I think that is probably, I think, a more interesting question, but you can talk about the safety risks, of course. Yeah. What do you so, think, Of course, yeah, safety is um, a massive um, a massive part of just the design of STEP. We design, sa we design safety into the concept design of STEP. Um, that's a requirement for us. So it's not something that we, you know, we make the machine and then we figure out after whether it's safe or not. It's just built into the machine. Um, of course, fusion itself uh, doesn't have the risk of that kind of runaway chain reaction that, that exists with fission. So that's something that we don't have, we don't have to worry about just by the nature of physics anyway. Um, safety in terms of just operation, uh, we've been, you know, well, the world collectively has operated nuclear related uh, machines. So not just fusion, but fission, uh, things like particle accelerators, uh, MRIs, but for a long, long time. Uh, so safety cases for nuclear things are, is very well understood already. So that's without even having to worry about chain reactions and things like that inside of a fusion machine. Um, in terms of environmental impact, for STEP specifically, we want to, we, we only design to, uh, to make sure we have low level waste um, at the end of the life of the machine. So low level waste means that it's safe to handle, it's, it's decayed sufficiently uh, less than 100 years after it's been decommissioned. Um, if you compare that to some of the fusion uh, fission materials that can take the order of tens of thousands of years. Uh, so again, that's something that's inherently built into the design of STEP. What happens to all the all the helium you produce in fusion reactions? And do you mean can you use it for more energy? Can you use it for, or what do you do with helium produced? All those kind of questions, I, I guess. So I, I'll I'll take this one. So obviously, um, when I showed us the, the DT reaction, um, obviously I said you know the helium is produced inside the plasma. Um, but obviously one of the good things is obviously because the helium comes off with about three and a half mega electron volts of energy. Obviously, it's electrically charged, so it stays in the plasma. So obviously, its primary purpose is, obviously, it can self-heat the plasma, which is obviously very good. So you're doing the reaction, and then obviously the reaction can keep, keep its own heat going. Um, obviously, once the helium dissipated all of its energy within the plasma, you want to get it out of there as quick as possible, obviously, because it chokes it up. Um, again, obviously, you know, we're not producing massive amounts of helium. Obviously, because, you know, we're, we're fusing, you know, the amount of plasma in there is milligrams. So you're producing very small quantities. Obviously, that's just because how efficient the fusion process is. Um, so obviously it's you know funneled down and then also it goes into our active gas fuel cycle system um, and then it's probably just held sort of in stasis and then it can obviously be discharged obviously because it's helium four you know it's completely natural it's non radioactive so it can just obviously can be just just be dispersed pretty much yeah that's great um the, there's a few questions about uh how accurate are simulations do you have simulations either i guess for material or for the plasmas or for all these kind of things and 
And um, also, is there any route to using AI in order to help you? And if so, is, is there any approach to that? So who wants to take that one? I can take it from the sort of plasma point of view. Um, so obviously, you know, we've had you know, we've had plasma codes and sort of whole plant codes for a long time. Um, so, so my sort of work sort of focuses on sort of whole plant modeling. Um, so that looks at pretty much very quick constant generation of the entire plant. So obviously, you know, at the end of the day, it's just the power plant. So obviously the core systems there have to all, you know, sort of follow the same rules. Um, in terms of the plasma, obviously you can do really in-depth plasma uh, simulations. Um, so you can look at sort of, you know, the scrape off layer plasma physics, the sort of, you know, density profiles you'll get, sort of the, you know, the fluxes and magnetic surfaces within the plasma. Also, we've been running those for years. You know, you can run those in high performance computing systems, that sort of thing. Um, on the AI point, obviously there's several teams across the world. I think recently a paper was published by MIT. They were obviously training in AI, sort of deep learning model to sort of detect sort of uh, talking about plasma disruptions, you know, uh, before they technically happened. Um, so obviously, you know, they've got different varial, you know, they've got different sort of variances in how quickly they can respond. Um, so obviously you want that to be able to detect, you know, when a disruption is going to happen. Um, so obviously, you know, I'll be great for us, obviously the SBI system, obviously, because we can sort of detect um, obviously when a disruption is going to happen. And obviously if the AI, if the AI learns how the plasma works um, through these relations, obviously they, they can then say, okay, a disruption is going to happen in say 200 milliseconds. And then obviously for us, we can fire, you know, the shell pellet injector, that sort of thing. So obviously you're, so you're really, really using a lot of different technologies, even computer science come into that as well. There's one last question I can't resist. I know we're pretty much out of time, but essentially you, you showed um, the robots. So I must know who makes up the name of the robots. I think people collectively do. So uh, some of them are acronyms. We love acronyms at the UKA, yeah. The UKA itself is an acronym. We have a little dictionary of acronyms, actually. Um, if you're asking about SPOT, um, SPOT is already named by its manufacturer, Boston Dynamics. Mascot stands for, um, of course, you know what? I have to come back to you with that one because there's so many acronyms, I can't keep them all in my head. Um, so yeah, so uh, we collectively decide them, the team that, des yeah. that designs them decides. Um, and if I can, yeah. whilst I'm talking about robots, I think someone asked about AI, actually. There yeah. is actually a collaboration uh, between the UK AEA, uh, the, I think the University of Manchester, Sellafield, um, the NDA as well, to incorporate um, AI with our robots. Um, so that serves many purposes, not just the operation of the robots, um, but also sort of size reduction in tasks and things like that and sort of management of tasks. Uh, so there is active yeah. work happening um, to know. bring AI into our work. Yeah, so it's amazing. We've got undergraduate projects at, at York who are yeah. trying to get robots to, to teach themselves yeah. how to how to operate. Yeah, so actually self-learning robots, which is very mm -hmm. cool. Unfortunately, we are absolutely out of time. I mean, I've overrun slightly, so I'll be getting in trouble from the important people around here. But for now, um, sorry for all those who asked questions and didn't get to them. There were brilliant questions and several left unanswered. And I do apologize for that we do have a have a forum that you can ask those questions on and there are students from our Centre for Doctoral Training who will be able to answer some of those questions that you have. Um, it really, it's a huge thank you to both uh, Sanchi and, and Chris from the UKAA for, for spending their evenings to, to explain some of this absolutely fascinating topic to us. Um, so thank you to both of you again. It's absolutely wonderful. As I say, we do have specialists who will be able to answer the questions on a daily basis, answering some other questions that you've asked this evening. Um, the recording of this will be available on the Nuclear Masterclass website early next week, and a link will be sent to ticket holders. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, it's, a, it's a great thing to have these people, experts, but also have a really enthusiastic crowd of people who are able to join us as well. So thanks so much again. Thank you to both of you, and thanks, everyone, for being here. Thank you. Thanks again. Have a good evening. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Cheers.